All right, so let's go ahead and get started. This is me, I'm Eric Gross. I am a senior software developer and uh, a veteran of the Navy. I was in the service for uh, about six years. I was a nuclear reactor operator and electronics technician and did a logic, a lot of nerdy computer and electronics stuff. And I'm also the co-founder of the Tech Academy, the company that is putting on this, uh, this presentation. All right, and I need to make sure I watch chat really well because what this means is that I don't have any audio of my own. <laughs> so if you need, if anybody has anything for me, throw it into chat because I can't hear nothing. All right, uh, let's go over a couple uh, quick rules. Um, we do have an assistant in chat. We have two of them because we're training some folks, right? And they'll monitor chat, answer questions. Uh, the only thing we ask is just be nice. If you're not a nice person, We'll probably just boot you from the meeting. That hardly ever happens, right? I do want to stress in terms of what to expect that some parts of the class will be kind of challenging. You might run into challenges. Part of the learning process, right, is to work through some of these challenges. Now, we do attempt to make these classes as easy as possible to get through and very, very valuable. So please use chat as needed. I'll help you. The assistants will help you. One big thing on that is that I just want to ensure that you type the code that we write tonight, because in a little while after some orientation, you're going to be writing some actual computer programs. I want to stress that you should try to write that code exactly as written. A misspelled word, a missing symbol, even something capitalized that shouldn't be can result in code errors, in program errors. So when we get to that point, pay really close attention to exactly what I write and try to do it exactly the way I do it. Now, I don't know that we have anybody on a mobile device. If by any chance you're joining us from a mobile device, you can listen, but you can't code. It doesn't work really well on a mobile device. Um, but please, if that is you, stick around. You'll still learn a lot. Also, it's important you put yourself in a distraction-free environment. There's a lot to focus on, and I don't want to lose you on anything. So if you got you know, kids in the background or you know dogs playing hopscotch or whatever, try to remove that. One last note here. If you fall behind, when we're writing the code, don't lose heart. Please just keep listening and learning because you'll still learn a lot, even if you're not able to type out every single thing. It's still very, very valuable data. I mentioned that this video will go up on YouTube today or tomorrow. We'll get you links for that. You also will be getting the full code to the program that we're going to look at tonight at the end of the class. And you'll be able to play a game. We're, gonna, we're, gonna, we're looking at how to design a, a game tonight, you'll be able to play that game and have the code and customize it if you want to, to experiment a little more. All right. You all know how to use chat. Not too worried about that. I've had a couple extra people um, join in. So if you haven't already, drop a note in chat and let me know where you're joining us from. Washington and Portland. Yay. Awesome. That's where I am right now. Okay, cool. So basic agenda, we'll have a short explanation of the Tech Academy, and then we're gonna write some code. You know, actually get your hands dirty writing code. Awesome. Uh, Melbourne, love it, I've been there, it's fantastic. Well, Melbourne, Australia, or Melbourne, Florida. <laughs> Probably Melbourne, Australia. All right, good, so we'll write some code, and that'll take up the bulk of our time tonight. Time permitting, <laughs> Time permitting, we'll have a brief Q&A at the end. We'll go over some information about who we are and our boot camps and what we do to help people break into technology. And we do have a free gift for you at the end, so please stick around till then. Whole class should take about an hour and a half. All right. So very brief little bit of information about the Tech Academy <clears throat> and who we are. We put on coding boot camps. If you're not familiar, coding boot camps are intensive technology certification programs, and they're designed to prepare people for entry-level positions in tech. Typically, they'll last anywhere between three and six months, and they focus on practical, modern skills. Now, we, meaning the Tech Academy, have been offering thorough, budget-friendly, flexible, and trusted coding boot camps for over a decade. Our certification programs are cost-effective, they're self-paced, they're fully online, and these coding boot camps are tailored for beginners, people that have no prior technical or coding knowledge. And finally, the programs cover in-demand skills. 
that the tech industry wants. They're endorsed by stellar online reviews and they're designed to fit around your personal schedule because we want to prepare you for your technology career with a well-rounded toolkit. Awesome. Okay, good. One last thing, by the way, is that uh, I don't know if you pay attention to this, but the average cost of boot camps in America is about thirteen or fourteen thousand dollars. Ours are under the national average, and we even have boot camps that start as low as fifty three hundred dollars. I want to wrap up this section by telling you what our mission statement is, why we even exist, because these classes are part of that mission statement. The mission statement of the Tech Academy is to graduate entry level technology professionals that excel in the basics of their field and thereafter have successful careers in the tech industry and whose actions raise industry standards and surpass client expectations. Our product is you working in tech. There's a relatively new service we, uh, we want to let you know about. This in addition to our boot camps, it's, it's pretty exciting. It's called the Tech Academy Accelerator and it's a monthly subscription program. It includes live weekly workshops with me, more about that in a second. It also includes access to over 100 educational videos and over 100 self-paced online mini classes. Now, these are more advanced than what you might find in a boot camp. In fact, when we do these workshops with me every week, they are a deep dive into complex technical subjects. So this is meant to be something to accelerate your career. The, key, the, the workshops include live you know, Q&A back and forth, open chat and voice. It's a whole conversation each week. And we cover topics that are suggested by the community because there's a bunch of people in this group and we ask their feedback on what they want to learn about. And I teach about that. So it's also really inexpensive. It's only $9.99 a month. You can try it out in your first seven days free. And Regina or, or Christine, if you could drop the link into chat, there you go. Awesome. Anybody who's interested in joining that, go ahead and fill out the form. You'll get a confirmation email. You will have to enter a credit card number, but you won't be charged right away. You do get a full seven days to try it out, see whether you like it. I'll be there next Tuesday giving a work, you know, a free workshop, which I'm super looking forward to. Um, and I'll give a second here to take a sip of coffee and give anybody who wants to click on that and join a chance. The last one was really fun, by the way. We went into how to create your own custom chat GPT. Like how to use ChatGPT to create a custom assistant for what we do is we create an assistant for a senior technology professional, like something to help research new concepts, design computer programs or sections of a program, um, get really great definitions, um, research problems that were really ambiguous. So we made a very specialized version of ChatGPT just to be my assistant. And in, along the way, showed people how to do that for themselves. It's pretty cool. All right. Let's go ahead and move into this. A couple bit of orientation things, because this is a free coding class, and we absolutely are going to do some coding here, a good amount of it. <clears throat> but the fact is, without the proper orientation, you'll be doing what I tell you to do or direct you on in a bit of a vacuum, and I don't want that. So the first thing we're going to do is just clear up a couple things like, what is a program? Well, a program is a set of written instructions that you can enter into a computer that control it. That's really it. You make the computer do what you want to do rather than having to deal with whatever programs are already on the computer and the programs kind of dictate your actions. When you are in charge and when you're a programmer, you're entering the instructions in and you control the computer. And you do that using what's called the programming language. And it's honestly just a set of words and symbols and phrases, very precisely formatted, but it looks very much like English. And they allow you to actually control the computers. So when we say we're making a, a program, what we're doing is actually entering in one instruction after another. And then when we have a bunch of instructions and we run that, it controls the computer and does what, what we want it to. That action is called coding. The action of entering those instructions in to computers to control them, make them do stuff, is called coding. The actual instructions you write are called code. So I know they're pretty basic terms, but I wanna make sure we're all on the same page. Last thing I wanna talk about is what is Python? Well, if we're gonna do this entering in of instructions, we need a language to do it in. And the language we're gonna use is called Python. Really popular, been around for, well, 33, 34 years. 
right? Um, and it's created by a, a Dutch programmer named Guido van Rossum, worked for Google for a long, long time, right? And well, Python is great for a couple of reasons. It's very readable. The instructions read like common English words and speech, and it's also very flexible and powerful. You can use it to create all kinds of different programs. We're gonna use it tonight to look at making a game. Now, before you even write a single line of code, before you enter in a single instruction in your program, one of the most valuable things I think we can do is to cover what are the elements of a program. What are the things that like every program has to have? The fact is that, in, well, at least in my experience, understanding these five elements is critical to grasping not just a particular programming language like Python, but just programming in general. So let's cover some of this stuff. The first element that every program has to have is what we call an entrance point. It's the first instruction. After all, if you put a program on a computer and say, run or start, right? Like Microsoft Word, you double click on the Word icon and Microsoft Word comes up, right? For that to happen, the computer needs to know, okay, what's the very first thing I do as soon as someone starts this program? What's my first instruction? And so a program will have a first instruction. Now, this is really valuable in a number of ways, but the biggest one I think I could communicate to you is this. If you move into technology and you get a, a job, you know, say a software developer or whatever, right? And you get moved on to a project where you're working on a program that's already been built, which is most of the time what you do. And let's say it's a really big program. It's kind of complex, lots of moving parts. You're going to need to have a strategy for starting to just understand what that program is all about, how it works and what it does. And one of the most important things you can do, one of the best tools you have is to look in that program and find what's the very first instruction that gets executed and then understand what it does and then follow along to the next instruction and the next and the next and so on and so forth. I know it sounds simple, but if you can try to picture in your mind what it would look like if you just took the program and found some instruction halfway through and tried to figure out from context what had just happened prior to that and what was going to happen after that, it's really difficult, I can tell you from experience. So knowing about the instructions, like the first instruction, the entrance point is actually pretty valuable. What's the next element of a computer program? Five basic elements we should look at is a thing called variables. Now, variables sound simple, but are very powerful. All this really is, is a piece of data you're gonna keep track of in a computer program where that data can change while the program is running. One of the simplest examples I can give you is if you're playing a, a game and you're asked to name your character in the game, well, you could name it Eric, but then half an hour later go, huh, that's a silly name, and change it to Kyrosorg the Magnificent or something equally stupid. The point is, you would have need to, you would need in your program a way to keep track of the name and to allow for the possibility of it being changed. That's what variables are all about. If you can picture the idea of a program where you don't get to change any data, it has limited value. What's this third element of a computer program? Well, this gets really, really, really powerful. It's the idea of being able to control the what we call the path of execution of a program. If you think of the idea of a program as being that first instruction that we covered, and then the next one, and then the next one, and the next one, it's a series of instructions. For this program we're making to have some value to help people do work, the program itself needs to be able to make decisions. Not like it's gonna decide on its own. You've got to tell it how to choose. For example, let's say you've got a computer program that helps you run a school and you have a hard limit that every class can only have 30 or fewer students in it. Well, if this computer program allows you to add students in and you try to add a student 
to a class that already has 30 students in it, you have to have a way of accounting for that and telling the program what to do in that case. Because in that case, you cannot add the student to the class in this made up scenario that I just came up with. That's what control and branching statements or instructions are all about. They're a way inside your program for you to determine what the available choices are and how your program can decide between those, uh, those possible choices. We're going to build some of this tonight, but this is on this list. It's well, all of these are important or wouldn't be five fundamental elements, but this is really cool. Be able to control what we call the path of execution, like what gets done in your program and allow your program to choose. What's number four? Well, it's a concept called subprograms. And just like it says, and again, you're going to build some of these tonight. It's the idea of sub, the uh, subprogram is the idea of programs within your program. Here's, here's an illustration of it. Let's say you're writing this program and you start at the beginning and you do one step after another, after another, after another. And let's say you've been working on this a while and you find that there's a certain set of, say, three or four instructions that represent a very common action in your program that you're making. And you find that you've probably repeated that same series of, say, four instructions a bunch of times while you've been writing this program. Well, that can be a problem. First of all, it's a waste of your time to retype the same instructions over and over again. And your time is valuable, don't you know? But probably more importantly, it's pretty easy to make a mistake. You've got these four instructions, and if you don't get them exactly right, you have all those opportunities to get it wrong. And finally, let's say you build your program and you've been using it for several months, but then you find that you need to make a change to how those four instructions are done. Maybe you change instruction number three a little bit. Well, now you have a big problem. You've got to go back through your program and find every single occurrence where you put down those four identical steps. And you've got to change that third step in every single instance that you did that. Well, that ain't good. That ain't good. So early programmers in the 1950s and 60s came up with the idea of a sub-program. They said, why don't we, if we find we have a series of instructions that we're doing over and over again, take them and put them in a box and give that box a name. And then when we need that set of instructions to occur, then we have the program call on that box by name, call on that set of instructions by name. And when the program is done doing the instructions in that box, go right back where it was when it left off. That box is called a subprogram. It's just a mini program that you can use inside your greater overall program. And they give you tremendous flexibility as a computer programmer. So last one, an exit. There needs to be some instruction or method to let the computer know, hey, this program is done. It's over. You can close it down. And the biggest reason this is valuable is because your computer that you're running your program on is doing a lot to help your program be effective. One of the most important things that your computer is doing for a program that's running on it is it's controlling the use of the storage areas inside the computer, the places where we store the data that a computer is working with. In order to make it so your program can actually work effectively, the computer has reserved some area, some chunk of that available data storage and said, nobody else can use this. No other programs can use this. It's reserved for this program right here. Say Microsoft Word. You're writing a document, Microsoft Word. Your computer has reserved, you know, set off a big chunk of the storage area inside the computer and said, this storage area is only for the document that Eric's working on which is good because the last thing you want is some other program running on the computer to start going into that data storage area and messing around with it. And suddenly your document you're working on is ruined. So all that is to say that we need a way to tell the computer, Hey, you don't have to do that anymore. This program is closing and you can release those things that you're doing for it. So 
If you look at these five elements, this is a very bold statement, but if you were to fully understand each of these five elements and use them as you studied a new computer programming language, or even your very first computer programming language, it would make a huge difference in how well that goes for you. And I'm saying that based on now decades of experience helping people to break into technology. So those are the five elements of a program. You're going to actually build these tonight in your coding. Now, let's get into that. In order to write some of this code, you're going to need a place to do the work. You're going to need a place to enter those instructions, to enter those co that code, and we call that a code editor. In chat, Regina has dropped a link. That link will take you to our code editor, and it will look a bit like this. Right on the right-hand side, you will see what the code editor looks like. Now, I'd like everyone to click on that link. You're going to need it to do the work tonight. And what I want you to do is set it up so that you're, unless you have two monitors, in which case life is good. I don't have two monitors right now myself. But if you don't have two monitors, you want to set things up side by side. On the right-hand side will be your code. In other words, the tab that you just opened. Um, Alex, that's a good question, right? He says he's using a specialized program already. Um, it would be a lot easier to use that code editor. But if you're really comfortable with, with this, I'm not going to mention it, so I don't want to confuse anybody. There's another code editor that he's already using. You can use that one if you like, Alex. Totally fine. So set it up so you have Zoom, uh, Zoom on the left, because that's where my presentation is going to be. And you have this tab with the code editor on the right. A little bit of help on that. Sometimes Zoom doesn't play very nice and you need to use this little words that say, you know, uh, Zoom meeting at the top to get the controls to resize it to appear. And sometimes on the browser, same thing. You might need to use the little uh, two different squares, two different size squares at the top to adjust it. But get yourself set up there, okay? All right. Now, we're going to do our coding. And I need you to get all set up. And now I'm going to stop sharing. And I'm going to get my code editor all set up and then share it. So give me just a moment. All right, now, because I do not have my normal two monitor set up, I'm gonna have to pull something up on my phone. So just bear with me for a second. All right, so when you start this thing, let me get the, the size bigger. I think if I go, oh, I think I have to do this. Control plus. How's the size on that? Let me pull up chat real quick and see whether that's any good. Oh, I'm not sharing, am I? Here we go. All right, now let me pull up chat. Can everybody see my code editor? Awesome, thank you all. Okay, good. So all this code in here, just erase all that. Let's just get rid of that. So first thing we need to do is this, is um, we're going to create our first instruction. It's gonna be the very first line of code that we enter. And we're gonna do it with a very simple um, action, which is we want to print something to the screen over on the right-hand side, okay? So the way to do that is pretty simple. There's an instruction built into Python called print. So I want you to type over here, P-R-I-N-T, print. Do not hit space. There's a little bit of a learning opportunity here, okay? Here's the way using parts of the language 
works, not just for Python, but for a lot of other programming languages. There's these special instructions built into the language. One of them happens to be print. And a lot of these instructions built into a programming language, they need some information in order to do their job. And that, you, that information needs to be provided by you, the programmer. In this case, if we want something to print over on the right-hand side, you know, over here, we have to give it the information of what to print. And the way that's done in Python is that immediately following the word print, you have an open and closed parentheses. So give me an open closed parentheses. Those of you who are paying attention may have noticed that you didn't even have to type the second of those parentheses, the closed parentheses, because this code editor is nice and friendly and it does that for you. Ah, Matthew Ross says we're gonna do hello world. And nah, I think we'll go a little bit different on that. We can do hello world if we want, okay? Well, let's keep it in themes of the game, okay? We're gonna be looking at how would you design a game of blackjack, right? So, in fact, as soon as I'm done with this instruction, I'll show you the blackjack game. But here we have these parentheses. Now, what goes inside the parentheses? The content you want to show on the screen. So that content needs to be numbers and letters, and it needs to be inside a double quote. So hit the double quote. Now, the double quote is usually to the left of the enter key, and you have to hit shift for it. Don't do two single quotes. Now, everything in between these double quotes will get printed to the screen. So let's say you're playing, you know, you're, you're talking about the name of a player who's playing a card game. Type my name is, and then put your name. You can probably spell name correctly, unlike what I did. And then that's the end of our first instruction. I want you to go up here and hit run. And hey, looky there, that worked. Now, I know this is dead simple. There's a couple aspects here that are really valuable to dig into, regardless of how simple the example is. Now, we can look at this as human beings, and it's pretty obvious how this will work. We're gonna have a command to print things, and the data we want to print on the screen will be inside of parentheses. Pretty straightforward, right? Well, computers don't understand any of that. Computers are, in fact, stupid. Hannah has a great question. Why is right? Why is this all in different colors? Now, the different colors are just an aid for you to understand the format of what you've written. They don't change how the code works at all. It's this program called Trinket that's making that happen. The fact is this command could all be black text on a white background and it would still work exactly the same. This is called syntax highlighting. Syntax is the rules surrounding the structure of a written language. And all this is, is an aid to make your code more readable. Does that answer that question, Hannah? It's a good question. Awesome, great question. So I said that computers are stupid and they don't actually understand what's going on. Let me actually explain to you what the computer does with this instruction to demonstrate to you, not only, I know I'm being sarcastic, but it's, it, it's, a, it's a worthwhile point. Not only how stupid the computers actually are, but how they work. See, when we hit run, let me show you exactly what the computer does. The computer starts at the beginning of the line and starts reading one character at a time. It reads P and it looks inside of the, Python language that's built into the computer and says, is that an instruction? Is P an instruction? And it isn't. So it says, oh, all right, I'm not going to do anything. And then it reads the next character, R. 
It says, well, is PR an instruction in Python? And it turns out it isn't. And then it reads the next one. It says, oh, I've got a PRI. And that's also not an instruction. And so on. And then by the time it gets to the T, it says, oh, I've got this P-R-I-N-T. Is that an instruction in Python? And surprise, surprise, it is. And so Python goes, oh, that's for me. That means something. All right, Mr. Computer, can you please check the next character? Because what I'm expecting is an open parentheses, and then a little while later, a closed parentheses, and I need everything in between those parentheses to do this job. It's a great question, Anna or, or Hannah. I'll read that out loud in a moment. The answer is no, but I want to explain why. So the computer says, okay, Python. Let me read the next character. Oh, look, it is an open parentheses. And so then what the computer does is it keeps moving forward. And all it's doing is it's saying, are you a closed parentheses? No. Are you a closed parentheses? No. Are you? Are you? Are you? And it gets all the way to right here and goes, are you a closed parentheses? Oh, yes, you are. Awesome. And only then does it go back and say, okay, let me look at everything in between. And it grabs that information and gives it to the Python language. And the Python language, which was told to print something, goes, oh, thank you so much, Mr. Computer. You looked inside those open and closed parentheses and gave me the information inside there. I'm now able to do my job and print something to the screen. So I know I went through that in possibly nauseating detail. I did so for what I consider to be a pretty important reason. One is that, again, computers are stupid. They don't understand. They, a computer is not looking at this whole sentence and going, oh, this means I need to print the text, my name is Eric, to the screen. It's not doing that. It can't do that because it doesn't even understand anything. All it can do, and this is the important point, is it can do one thing at a time. And having done that, it can go on to the next thing. And having done that, it can go on to the next thing. There's no understanding involved. There's no intelligence. And so you have to work on patterns. In this specific instance, the computer programming language we're learning, called Python, has a pattern built into it. And that pattern is the five letters, P, R, I, N, and T. That pattern is built into the language by this dude, Guido von Rossum, we were talking about. And since the computer, the computer I'm using has Python on it, when I go and hit run, the exact process I just talked about will happen. The computer will literally go through one character at a time until it finds something that Python says, that pattern makes sense. I can do something with that. Please go see if the rest of this instruction follows the correct pattern. So you'll find a lot of that in computers, but back to the bigger picture, we talked about five different elements of a computer program. We have our first instruction here. When we ran this, it worked because it's at the top of the file. It's at the top of the screen. That's the first thing that's gonna be executed. Now let's move on to the next one, the variable. Go ahead and hit enter a couple of times. Now we don't need to have an empty space on line two. We could start writing right here, but just for readability, I like to go down and just skip a line. We're gonna create a variable. And the variable is going to store, it's gonna keep track of what's the name of the current player of our card game. So the variable, I think we'll call it player. I'm not gonna like be super creative here. And in Python, the way you create a variable, is you actually just write out what the name is that you want for it. So type player, P-L-A-Y-E-R, and hit space.
Now, what this means in Python, what this instruction, because this is an instruction. This instruction means to Python, hey, Python, please create a variable called player. Now, let's dive into a little more detail because this is actually a really good thing to know as a programmer. What exactly happens inside the computer when we, quote, unquote, create a variable called player? Well, it's actually really simple. Inside the computer are these little devices called memory. They're little physical devices. They're electronic devices. And they allow you to store data electronically. You can store a written document on there. You can store the grade point average of a bunch of students. You can sto store uh, all of the different you know, information about an image. It was a photograph of a race car. All this kind of information can be stored on these physical devices called memory. So again, when we make a variable called player, what actually happens is a little teeny section of that physical device with little places to store information is reserved. It's set aside and it's given a name. It's given a unique identifier and that identifier is the word player. That's the first thing that happens. Now, in fact, that, that's really all that happens. We find a section of a place we can store data and we give it a name. But that's only half of the work. We need to tell it what the actual data is. In our case, what is the name? Well, let's say I'm feeling really odd and my name is, not, my name is gonna be uh, Tony today. Well, we need to put information inside that variable. In other words, we're literally going to say in that little device called memory, what information is going to be stored at that exact spot. And the way you do that was, is with another specialized Python symbol, which is the equal sign. So type equal and then space. Colin asks, essentially, if we could ask the user for their input. And yes, you can do that. It's a lot more complex on a website than we have time to go into. But yes, that's a great question, Colin. Could we ask the user for their name and then use that to set the value? That's a great question. What we're going to do is we're just going to add a value to this. The way you do that, because it's text, is you can do double quotes. And what did I say? Tony, here we go. So, again, I know this is, Matthew asked, can Python be used for the visual component of a game too? Absolutely. In fact, we're going to do some, some very limited visual component here in a minute. I just want to stress something here. I know that this instruction on line three looks really simple. And it is. It's very simple. But there's so much valuable to know here. The first is there's two things that occur on this instruction. And they both have special names. The first one is that when we give Python this exact instruction, we give it the word player followed by a space. When we do that, we create the variable. The actual word for that is called declaring the variable. And what does that do? Well, we already said it reserves some space on a memory device to store information when we have the information. So that's the first thing that happens. The second thing that happens is we put a value in that variable. I'll answer that question in a second, Matthew. It's a good one. So the value we're going to put in there is Tony, like we said. That's called assigning a value. So terminology, we declare a variable called player and we assign it a value of Tony. We declare a variable called player and we assign it a value of Tony. Now, 
let's have a little more fun. Hit enter a couple of times. And we're going to print my name is, but we're going to use this variable. So do a print, P-R-I-N-T. Let me answer this question real quick. MR says, so the word player is a Python instruction, or he asks, he says, so the word player is a Python instruction, regardless of the fact that we're trying to build a blackjack, uh, blackjack game? Absolutely. It's a pipe, like whatever name you give for the variable, we could use the name. Don't type this. Don't type this. We can go foo equals Tony. That's the name of a variable. We could do um, bobbly gook. That's the name of a variable. And so that actually counts as like a, a Python instruction. It's an instruction to make a variable with the following name. We chose player because it's a little more logical than bobbledygook. <laughs> That's a good question. All right, now let's go back down here to print. Now, again, don't hit space and do your double open and close parentheses. Now, we want to be able to have what gets printed change based on the current player. So give me a double quote and say, my name is and a space. And now this part's really important. So go very slow. My name is and space, make sure it's all inside these quotes right here. And then go right after the double quote, but before the parentheses, and now we're going to use this variable we made called player. Because we don't want Eric to be printed there. What we actually want is the value of the variable called player. So the way you do that is you are going to take this set of text. We call it a, a set of text. We call it a string. This set of text that says my name is. We're going to take this string of my name is, and we're gonna add another string onto it. So go again, right after the double quote, in a space, and then a special symbol, which is gonna connect two strings. And that symbol is a symbol and a space. Now this is not math. That's not a mathematical symbol. We're not using that to add numbers. We're using it to take one string, you know, a collection of characters like text and another string, a collection of text and connect them together. That's what the plus symbol does here. That's how Python works. The fancy name for that, by the way, is called concatenation. That means taking two strings and putting them together. Concatenation. Well, now we need the second string. Now, we aren't going to, don't type this. We're not going to go, Tony. That's not what we're going to do. It's not what we're going to do. We're going to instead use our variable player, P-L-A-Y-E-R. And when Python gets to this part of running the instruction, it'll grab the current value in the variable called player. So go ahead and run this. And first we run the my name is Eric. Then we run creating a variable called player with the value Tony. And then we print my name is followed by the current value of player. To test this, let's add another instruction and change the value of player. So now I want you to type in player, work on that same variable, assigning it a different value. I want you to put your name. Don't type your name here. I want you to actually put your name in there. Then do the same print instruction. Print my name is, and then plus player, just like we did right up here. It's the exact same instruction. I just want you to see that what gets printed out changes because we change the value in the variable. Variables are so powerful in what they can do. All right.
about to move on to something else. If there's any quick questions, throw them in chat. Oh, we lost the feed. Is it back? Oh, okay, good. Um, Matthew has a brilliant question. He says, so it just changes to whatever was declared last? Um, yes, although this isn't really important. First of all, Matthew, I super appreciate that you're using your terminology correctly. On line three, we declared a variable called player, and we assigned it a value. I said that probably five times. On line seven, we're not actually declaring it. It already exists. Python knows that because it's keeping track of it. So we, I'm only saying that just because uh, I want you to make sure you get the terminology right. We are reassigning a value. We're assigning a new value to an already declared variable. But to answer your question, because Matthew's question was, so it just changes to whatever was declared last? Yes, using the right term terminology, it changes to whatever the most recent assigned value is. Because remember, computers only do one thing at a time and they do them in order. So we do this instruction and when we're done with it, we do this one. And when we're done with it, we do this one. And when we're done with it, we do this one. And so by the time we get to nine, this one has already occurred. And so there's a different value to player there was, and then there was when we did this one. Alberto has a great question. Can we use the final code we learned here in Visual Studio and try to make it multiplayer with friends? Absolutely, you can try to do that. And that would be a heck of a project. If you've already got some coding experience, you can probably pull that off. All right, so we've covered an entrance point. We've covered variables. Now let's cover control and branching. This is... Like without the ability to control the direction a computer program takes, programs are not very valuable at all. Remember, we're using programs to automate things very often that human beings would have to do themselves. And very often we make decisions. So in your program, you need a way to tell the computer to make a decision and based on the result of that decision to do one of two or more possible options. That's what we're going to build right now, okay? MR says, I'm going to assume that there is a more advanced instruction to regulate any kind of conflict for the last instruction con uh, contradictions, correct? Yeah, that's way beyond the scope of what we covered now, but that's a, that's a really good thing to think about. Yes. That's really good. I like that. That was a really bright question. All right, so now we're looking at this concept of control and branching statements. In fact, I'm going to introduce something new, which is a comment. If you do the, let me go back over here. If you do the uh, hashtag or the square, you know, um, uh, pound symbol, everything after that on that line is just a comment. It's just there for informational purposes. It's not an instruction. It's not for the Python language. It's only for you. So let's do uh, control and branching. That's just so we can know what we're doing. We could even go right here and do variables. So go down to the bottom there and let's talk about control and branching. The way control and branching works is a pretty simple concept. In fact, I'm gonna do another comment and I'm going to write it in just plain English. If condition is true, then do thing one, else do thing two. Now, you don't need to write all that. I just want to talk through this. This is not an instruction. Remember, I put a hashtag here. I put a pound symbol. This is just a comment to talk about. Now, this does read like English, though. There's a logical concept here that we've all executed a million billion times in our lives. 
if something's true, then do blah, blah, blah. If it isn't true, do the other thing. That's an example of a control and branching statement, and we're going to build one. So we're building a blackjack game. Now, in blackjack, the whole concept is if you add up the value of cards and you end up with something greater than 21, then you lose. So over and over again, we're going to need to check what's the sum, what's the total of the value of all the cards. So we're going to write what will happen if the sum is greater than 21 and if it isn't. That's what we're gonna write. Now we're gonna keep it super simple. In the actual program that you'll see in a little while here, the actual blackjack program, it'll be a little more complex. But we're gonna keep it simple just because I wanna teach you what's on my line 13. How do I do that kind of a thing in a programming language? How do I? figure out if a condition is true and depending upon whether it is or isn't true how do i control whether it does the first thing or the second thing so hit enter a couple of times just for readability you don't need that extra space but it makes it easier to read now, this won't be a shock but the instruction for doing an if in python is <laughs> if that's all and you need to give it a condition. So the condition, and I'll talk to you about how to create a condition, something that you figure out whether or not it's true. The condition goes inside of an open and closed parentheses, which shouldn't be a shock. So give me a pair of open and closed parentheses. Now, how do we write a condition? I'm going to write it from the inside out. Here's what I mean. I want you to follow me very closely here. Hit space and then hit the equals key twice and then hit space. And then let's talk. Those two equals signs are a specialized symbol in the Python language. This same symbol is used in a lot of programming languages. But in Python, that symbol means a very specific thing. Here's exactly what it means. It means to the left of this symbol, Mr. Computer, to the left of me will be one piece of data. To the right of me will be another piece of data. Are those pieces of data equal? Yes or no? That's what that symbol means. It means check for equality, please. You are instructing the computer with, with this symbol right here. You are instructing the computer to look at the two pieces of data on either side of the symbol and check whether or not they are equal. That's what that means. Now, the fact is, it sure looks remarkably like this symbol right here, the, the single uh, equals, but it's got nothing to do, one has nothing to do with the other. This symbol up here is assigning a value. It's called an assignment operator, an assignment symbol. This is a check equality symbol. It's an equality operator. These happen to resemble each other, but don't ever get them confused. So again, I'm building this from the inside out. So what I wanna do is on the left-hand side, give it one piece of data to check, and on the other side, give it the other. So, I need a way to keep track of the total, and I need to know whether or not the total is greater than 21. I need a variable. Hmm, let me go back up and make myself a variable. So go back up to where that empty space is, and let's make a variable called sum, S-U-M. Oh, I think that might be reserved. Let's do one uh, total, there we go, yeah. So make a new variable called total, we add up all the total of the cards in your hand, and we're going to assign it a value, and it's going to be 18. So let's just say that we happen to have some cards in our hand. We have a 10 and an 8. Well, inside here, I want to see whether or not the total is greater than 21. So... 
total is equal to 21. Now let's talk about this. Is this actually what I need? Do I need to check for equality? Someone put in to the chat what they think I should actually be checking. Oh, yeah. Look at that. Matthew's already on the wrong track. It says less than or equal. Oh, I like that. Yeah, I like the less than or equal. Yeah. So that symbol is this. Oh, that's the less than or equal. So let's change that. That's brilliant. And by the way, MR, I see your question. It's a good question. And we'll answer it in a moment. You guys are a great, great group of students. This is excellent. So let's stop here for a second and just talk about this. Look at my line 13. This is just a comment. It's not a real instruction for a computer program. It's just describing how can we control the path of a program. And it says, if a condition is true, then do thing one. Otherwise, do thing two. Well, this is a specialized symbol that says, hey, take a look at the data on the left and the data on the right. If the data on the left is less than or equal to the data on the right, then this whole thing is true. The big takeaway here, this is a pivotal, super important thing in programming because you're going to do it over and over and over again is a condition is something you can tell whether or not it's true or false. That's all it is. And it's unambiguous. There's never any wishy-washy about it or, well, it's mostly false or it's mostly true. No, it's cut and dry, true or false, period. And we have, in fact, inside of these parentheses, we have something that is absolutely going to be true or false. No questions about it. So, now let's decide what to do based on this condition. Here's how that works in Python. Remember, we're trying to replicate this kind of logic right here. In Python, here's how you do it. What we have on my line 15 is a control instruction. We're controlling things by checking a condition. Now we need two or more possible things to be done. Those things to be done are called branches. Think of it as there's a main trunk on a tree and then you can branch off and go a different direction. That's how they got that name. All right. I do want to answer this question for MR before I forget. Everybody pay attention to this. It's such a really smart question. MR asks, how does one know what terms in Python are reserved? Is there a list one can look up inside of Python? Brilliant question, MR. Been doing this for a long time. It's been a very long time since someone asked that. I super love that. You don't look it up inside of Python, but you can go to python.org and look it up. Or you can go reserved words in Python, like that, look at that, Python reserve words list your complete guide. Now, I'm not going to show you this because you're going to get a bunch of confusing words thrown at you all at once, but the fact is, it's very easy to find this stuff out, and that was a fantastic question, MR. That was a fantastic question. All right, so let's get back to this, okay? Remember, this instruction right here is just a control instruction. We now need to give it at least two different options. First of all, the first option you have to give it is, what do we do if this is true? What do we do if this condition right here is true? Well, if you've ever played blackjack, you know at this point, you're going to ask the... Uh, the um the player do you want another card now if they're not stupid and they're at 18 they're probably not going to take another card but that's what you're going to do now 
the way this works in Python is at the end of the control instruction, we have a control instruction with this if. You put a colon, and then this part's critical. So please pay please pay close, close please play English. It's fun. Please pay close attention. Remember that right after a control instruction, you're going to give it a branch. What do you do if the following, you know, if, if the condition is true? In Python, the way you indicate to the computer the set of instructions that are only to be done if the condition is true is you indent those or you move them over by two spaces. And watch, if you hit enter, notice that this code editor has already done that for you. It's moved the cursor over two spaces. What this means is instructions that are entered right here, indented by two spaces, instructions that we enter here will only be performed if the value of the variable called total is in fact less than or equal to 21. So what are we going to do? Well, we're going to, I'm not going to program this out in detail, but we would basically ask the player, do you want another card? So let's just do a print and say, do you want another card? Question mark. Now we're not going to handle all the logic behind actually finding out their answer and grabbing another card and all that. You'll see all that in the real game. So that's one. Let's go ahead and run this and see if it works. Hey, look at that. It actually does say, do you want another card? And it does that because currently at the time we run line 15, the value of the variable total is in fact less than 21. But what do we do otherwise? Well, go to the end, watch this, hit enter. And this part's really important. Right now, because our code editor is so friendly, our cursor is indented by two spaces. But we don't want to be right there because we are done writing the instructions that'll happen only if total is less than or equal to 21. So if we start writing something right here, it will only be performed if total is less than 21 or less than or equal to. So what you gotta do is go back, hit the backspace key, and now we need our other control instruction, and that will be else. And hit a colon, and hit enter, and notice it now, helpfully, indents by two. And it did that because now we have another control instruction, else is a control instruction. It's saying, hey, I'm in charge of deciding whether or not the following instructions actually ever happen. And they're only going to happen if this wasn't true. So what do we want to have happen? Well, we're going to print, sorry, you lose. So print, sorry. What is going on here? Okay. You lose. Let's run this. Notice it didn't change anything. So why don't we change our total to 22 and run it. Oh, now it says, sorry, you lose. So look at this. Oh, great question. I love this. We have very attentive students. MR says, why does the editor add that little drop down arrow after each branch instruction? Everybody watch what happens. Watch my cursor, go to the drop down, and I'm going to click it. It collapsed what's inside the if. That is a convenience thing. Sometimes the set of instructions inside the if are quite long. And if you are trying to read a big old chunk of code, it can help 
to just collapse that temporarily. But then you can expand it if you want to. That was a good question. All right, good. So if you've caught up, then what you have is right here. This is some really, really, really valuable, if simple, computer code. With this little chunk of code, we can determine whether or not we're going to end the game or keep on going. I'd say that's pretty valuable, wouldn't you? And here's the next thing. So that's control and branching. The next thing I want to point out is, aren't we going to have to do this over and over and over and over and over and over and over again when people are playing blackjack? Every single time they get a new card, aren't we going to have to do these four instructions? And might I add, this is a gross simplification of what we're actually going to have to do. In the real game, we've got to do quite a lot in order to have them, quote unquote, pick another card. So I ask you, do you want to type this series of instructions over and over and over and over again? I don't. And that's where a, yeah, exactly, someone says no. That's where a sub program comes in. Why don't we take this series of instructions that I have highlighted right there? This series of instructions that's capable of telling whether or not someone's gone over the total and turn those into a little sub program that we can use over and over again as we want to. Here's how you do that go to the end. Hit enter. Remember to go back. Okay. Hit enter a couple more times just to give us some space. And let's make a comment. Making a sub program. Because what we want to do is we want to give this set of instructions a special name and be able to use it over and over again. And here's how you do that. You, de you make what's called a function. Now, Python uses the word function for subprogram. In fact, there's thousands of computer programming languages. Pretty much every single one of them has a way to make subprograms, but they use all kinds of different words for it. Function, method, subroutine, subprogram. Those are the top ones. It all means the same basic concept. A repeatable set of instructions that you can call upon as needed, which is really valuable. So let's make one. Hit enter there. In Python, the instruction to create the instruction to create a function is def for define. So type def and then space. What Python needs next is the name of the subprogram. What are you going to call it? And we're going to call it check over. Like, have we gone over? That's why I'm calling it check over. Have we gone over? I happen to like capitalizing my function names. You don't need to. You could call it, don't do this, by the way. Don't follow this right now. You could call it. You can call it check over like that. That's fine. You can call it check over like that. You can have it all lowercase. <clears throat> it doesn't matter. Let's go back to the way I want it. What's important is this. That's its official name. That's the subprogram's official name. So later on, when you want to use this subprogram, when you want the instructions that we're going to put inside it to actually be performed, you better call it by its given name or it won't work. All right, so we have used the DEF instruction to say, hey, we're going to create a subprogram. And again, they're called functions in Python. We're going to create a function. And then you've given it a name. And now you need to give it something else. This is pretty important. This function actually need some information in order to do its job. Can someone put into chat, what is the information that this function will need in order to do its job?
Now, that's pretty insightful. MP says, will it need the if function? You're on the right track. This is what is going to be inside the function. But even in order to do its job, it needs some information. Remember, what's the job? Making a subprogram. This subprogram, this one will check if a player has gone. Don't type all this out. Gone over 21 in their cards. So what information will it need? It needs some data. Good, we're on the right track. MR says it needs digits. What digits? What, what's the, what does that represent? Colin, that probably would work, but I can do all that right now. MR says quantity, yes. It needs, what is the current total of the cards in your hand? That's perfect. So. The way you give a function, again, that's what subprograms are called in, uh, in, in Python. The way you give a function information is you put it inside of parentheses. So give yourself some parentheses right there. Matthew, you're spot on. It says it needs the value of their cards. So let's put in here that when we use this function called check over, when we use this function, we're going to give it some information that's called card total, C-A-R-D-T-O-T-A-L. Type it like that. Lowercase on the C, uppercase on the T. Not because it changes anything, but just to be consistent with what I'm doing so it's easier for you to follow along. So this part is critical. We are only creating this function right now. We haven't actually used it yet. And I'll show you how that works in a minute. What we're saying here is when we do, in fact, use this function, it's going to expect to be given some information. And it will call that information card total. Good. So now go to the end and type a colon. And when we hit enter and we indent, this is pretty cool. Every instruction we have following this DEF line, every instruction we have that's indented by two spaces will be the instructions inside the subprogram. They're the instructions inside the function. What do we want to put in here? Well, we want to check whether or not card total is greater than 18. And we want to do things with it. So, sorry, 21. So, let's do if, and now we have this card total. Less than or equal to 21, just like we did before. You should be able to do a lot of this here on your own, too, because we're just replicating what we did over here. And notice we've indented even two more times. So what do we do if it's less than or equal to 21? Well, we know we print want another card. Okay. Otherwise, make sure you go back to this. Else, print. Sorry, you lost. And go all the way back to the beginning. I'll give you a minute to get caught up. Always nice to spell words correctly, Eric. All right, so this next part is just so important. I'm going to ask a question. Right now, when we run this, What's the last message we're going to receive over on the right-hand side? Someone put that in chat. Don't run it. Just guess. When we run this, what's the final message? Right now, we have these messages. My name is Eric. My name is Tony. Blah, blah, blah. 
MR says, we're going to get, sorry, you lost. That's wrong. I'll tell you why in a second, MR. Matthew Ross says the same one. Do you mean, sorry, you lose? Is that what you mean, Matthew? Well, let's run it. <laughs> Matthew says, yes, if I'm right, no, if I'm wrong. Ah! You made my day. Now, look, I just ran this. You all can run it. Right now, total is equal to 22. Now, let's talk about this. You might think that this is what's going to get printed. And I want to talk about exactly why. So please just stop for a moment and follow along with me. Here's the big picture. This line says to the computer, hey, I want you to create a set of instructions sort of inside a little box. And we're going to call that box check over. Just put these instructions, and here's the instructions. Put them inside this box, and this is the important point, so please listen very carefully. Put these four instructions inside this box and set the box aside. The box has a name. The name of the box is check over. But all we're doing is we're saying set that box off to the side so that later on, if the program wants to use the instructions in that box, it can do so. That's all we've done. We, and this is the thing we haven't done. Good job, MR. MR says, oh, I see what I did. What we haven't done is actually request that this function be performed. We have not done that. Let's do that. Go down to the very bottom. MR, I love that. Go to the very bottom, hit enter just for some space. And I, let's say my total right now is 11. Let's just say that. I can use the function check over just by typing this name, check over. Make sure you type it exactly the way you did it. And just pass in the value 11. Now run this. Look at that. And it says, one another card. Now, why does it say one another card? Because we actually performed this function. And we passed in a value of 21. That value was stored in a variable called card total. And right here, we took the value of card total, which was 11, and compared it to 21. And lo and behold, it's less than 21. And so we executed this branch. Do it again. Put in the number 30. Run it. Ah, now it says, sorry, you lost. So recognize that we can, with one line of code, we can do this check over function every single time the dealer deals a card with one line of code instead of four lines of code. And that's the value of a subroutine or a subfunction. Matthew says, uh, how would you make that a randomly generated hand total? I'm not going to get into random right now, right? Um, just because it's beyond the scope and we're running out of time. But um, there is a, it brings up a really valuable thing. There's a bunch of pre-made code that really bright people have made over the years. And one of them is a collection of pre-made code that's called a library. There's a library of code called random. And random lets you create random values. And so it'd be relatively easy to come up with a random value that represented the cards. But it's beyond the scope of what we're doing right now. It's a good question though, Matthew. All right, so we've covered an entrance point, variables, control and branching statements and subprograms. We're not going to cover exit simply because in Python, once 
your computer reaches the final instruction in the last file, it already knows how to end off the program. You don't have to do anything special as the programmer. But now I want to show you the real program. Um, Regina, if you can share the uh, full code, it'll look like this. You can see it on the screen. And I want you to copy everything in here. Let me copy that, drop it in. Okay, grab that link. Oh, uh, do, 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 do. Okay, grab that link, okay? Grab all the code in it with a control A and a copy. And now erase everything you have here and paste in the code. The first thing I want you to do is I want you to run this. Play a game. All right, so I'm going to bet three chips. All right, so I get a king of clubs and a jack. Oh, that's 20. No, I'm going to stand. Sorry. So the dealer has a six and a nine. That's a tie, oh man, fine, I'll play again. So take a moment and play a couple games, okay? Ah, Matthew, I bet it all, baby. <laughs> um, MR says, no, my little code. You can do control Z and it'll all come back. Place my bet, yeah, I'm gonna bet it all. 10, seven to four, I got 11, ooh, ace of diamonds, oh, it's an ace, oh, come on, hit me. Seven and four, 12. Eight and eight. Ah, uh, twelve this stinks. All right, hit me. Something wrong with my setup here. All right, that's fine. Okay, so let's go and stop playing for a second. And I just want to show you something kind of cool. If you look at this code. It might seem like there's a lot going on, okay? But you understand almost all of it right now in its most fundamental terms. A graduate of our boot camps could go through here and figure out everything the logic here and could probably build this program on their own and more. But first, let's just talk about a couple things. Remember I said you could have a pre-made collection of code called a library? Hey, this is bringing in that pre-made collection of code called the random library because we do in fact use it in this game so import just brings in this pre-made code and then look what we're doing we're making a function called create deck and another function for card value and another for hand value and another one for get valid bet and another function and another function called play game and in fact we don't actually start doing anything of significance until right here, when we actually start the game by calling the play game function. Now there's obviously some stuff of complexity inside here. We're not gonna dive into all of it. I just wanna show you, you can actually see these five fundamental building blocks. We can figure out what the first instruction is. It's execute the play game here. We can see, oh look, here's some control and branching statements. If, else if, else oh, okay fine we can see a bunch of variables here's a variable called deck here's a variable called player hand oh, and look i'm assigning them values now yeah there's some words here you don't understand yet but it'd be easier to research what those things mean because now you know the five fundamental elements you can go oh if i'm got a variable here i'm assigning it a value what is pop in assigning a value? You can look something like that up and you, given some time, could figure out what all that stuff is. So this is the code. It's yours to play around with. It's a fun little game to play, okay? All right, so let's move on to here. Do, 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 do. All right. 
Can you all see my slides? And are they full screen? And can you see my speaker notes? Wow, that was loud. Okay, awesome. Okay, so I'm not going to do any like purposeful Q&A just because of the time it is right now. And you guys were phenomenal with questions during the actual presentation. Thank you for that. You will have an opportunity to actually send questions in to me if you want to. What I want to do right now is just take a minute or two here and just, if you'll, if you'll grant me a little bit of time, explain a bit more about who and what we are and how for the right person, we could be incredibly valuable. And by the way, stick around. We have a phenomenal free gift coming for you. Okay. So I mentioned these earlier, but I want to elaborate on it. We've got 12 online coding boot camps. And as you can see, they cover pretty much every significant area of the technology industry in terms of like what you could specialize in. AI, computer programming, website development, cybersecurity, design, data science, video game development, mobile app development. In fact, we've got more certifications than any other coding boot camp on earth. And this is the point I just really want to stress because we're, I'm really proud of what we put together, but also I just firmly believe it's incredibly effective. Our boot camps are self-paced, but they're also instructor supported. They're flexible. Students set their own schedule and they can enroll 365 days a year. Our content is very well-rounded and it's very in-depth. And the boot camps are affordable. Again, they're priced under the national average. And one of the most important elements, every single one of our programs includes both job placement training and job placement assistance. So you learn how to actually get a tech job and then you get a tremendous amount of help in doing so. But most importantly, these programs are designed for absolute beginners. No prior technology knowledge or experience is required. So you don't have to be a nerd to get through these programs. The only thing that getting a, you know, being a nerd helps with is the stupid jokes that I leave in a lot of the curriculum videos I recorded. I'm not going to apologize for them. And I want to stress again that Princess Bride is the greatest film in the history of mankind. So, so <laughs> all, that, all that aside, who are these programs for? Well, for anyone looking for a better career, the fact is that technology is a really great industry to work in. <laughs> Matthew says, hides pocket protector. <laughs> Excuse me, I apologize. <laughs> a bunch of great, great, awesome people. So again, our programs for anybody who wants a better career, tech is a really good industry to work in. You can work, there's remote work opportunities. You have better work-life balance and it pays really well. Yes, that word does not mean what you think it means. So we're really proud of this. We consistently land on every major best coding bootcamp list out there. On average, our, our average review rating across all the major bootcamp review websites is 4.8 out of five stars. And that's based on student and graduate feedback. And I, I want to elaborate a little bit. Like I said, we're, we're talking about tech and the fact that it's a good place to work. Well, why would you want to work in tech? It does actually have good work-life balance. It's really rare to have a job in tech where you're working 60, 70, 80 hours a week, for example. And, and you usually work really good, decent hours. And it's entirely possible to get remote work sometimes even at the very beginning of your career, now that COVID has happened, right? It's also a very creative industry, which is really, really cool. And you can take a lot of personal pride in your work. Finally, it's a stable industry that pays well. It pays really well, honestly. If you apply yourself and keep learning, you get regular increases in pay. And I've talked about this in other presentations. The fact is that there's a lot of jobs out there that really don't actually pay a living wage. Tech is an exception to that, which is pretty cool. Now, that said, there are some barriers to entry, especially when you look at the idea of a boot camp. I mean, there's some barriers to entry to going to college. Yeah, it takes years and many, 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 many tens of thousands of dollars, sometimes hundreds of thousands. But if you look at a boot camp, there's some barriers. One of the biggest ones is money. It, it costs thousands of dollars in curriculum. Um, Alberto, that is a great question. Asked about, do you accept vouchers from employers as pay and payment? Um, it totally depends on the internal policies of an employer. You're definitely going to want to book a call with one of our admissions personnel. They have a tremendous amount of experience in 
helping you navigate that to the best possible outcome. Usually, your employer has a vested interest in upskilling you, and especially in tech, they know they're going to get their return on investment. So I can't answer a blanket yes or no, but you should talk to one of our admissions personnel. It's a great question. Okay, so back to this. One of the barriers to entry of doing a boot camp is the money. I mean, the tuition costs thousands of dollars. What we've done to help with that is we have multiple financing options, including if you can pay the full tuition up front, there's a massive discount. I'll tell you more about that in a second, okay? We do also have monthly payment options if you have no credit or bad credit. The fact is we've got a tuition option for in everyone in any financial condition. The thing I want to stress here is that it's my belief now having helped thousands of people break into tech that doing a tech academy boot camp is frankly an investment in yourself. You are making yourself into a, a possessor of skilled, valuable knowledge that's in high demand because you can do things that other people don't want to do or don't know how to do. What's another barrier to doing a boot camp? Well, that would be time. I mean, it takes a while to get through learning even the material you're learning in the boot camp. And our boot camps are, they've got some depth to them, right? Now, some boot camps approach this time problem by making students go through the program in what they call a cohort. It's a group of students that all start on the same day and move through the program all at the same pace. I've been in that kind of a system. We kind of all were, unless you were very lucky, in our elementary and high school educations. Everybody moves at the same pace. It stinks. It's a horrible way to teach, period, but especially for technology, especially for becoming comfortable in applying what you learn and really getting, building up your, your confidence as a developer. It's a horrible way to learn because some things you'll learn, they'll just go in really, really quick. And some things are just going to take a little more mental effort and practice to break through. It was super important to us that we provide a way to get through our programs that allows for that. And we don't lose good people because we're trying to move everybody through at the same pace. So we don't do it that way. Our programs are fully online. You can choose your study schedule. They're self-paced. And we even allow part-time options. So it means you can study at the same time as you're carrying a job. Or some people do it while they're actually going to school. Finally, one of the barriers to breaking into, you know, doing a boot camp is that you're going to have to need, you have to have some technical interest or ability. Now, this part's super important. If you tried to break into tech already, you may have felt like some of the technology education materials you're trying to study are too hard. And you may has started to feel that the problem is you and that maybe you're not that bright. It's absolutely not true. If you're interested in that, I can talk to you about it in more detail. We have some great presentations we put out on the internet about that, okay? The reason this happens is that some educators who create technology training programs assume too much prior knowledge on the part of the student. We do not make that mistake at our school. What this means is you don't have to be a nerd to get through our programs. You don't, there's no technical background required to enroll which is really cool. Matthew Ross asks, would you say your boot camp gives more of a fundamental understanding than most? I would say that a thousand percent and that's on purpose and it isn't all my work. Very early in the formation of our school, Matthew, something really, really cool happened. And this is for everybody. We were building up our first custom curriculum back nine and a half years ago. We've been around a little over 10 years, right? And I wrote a little bit of courseware that I thought was really introductory and would be a great way to introduce people. And my partner, Jack, who didn't have at that point as much technical experience as I did, which was, turned out to be a really good thing, actually. He took a look at this stuff and he's looking at it and his head spinning. He's like, Eric, he says, do you think that people learn how to make a basic web page in high school? Well, I went, well, yeah, I mean, of, of course they do. And he went, no, no, Eric, they don't. So these two things that you're trying, that you're just assuming they know, I can guarantee you most of our students will not know what these two things are. And I went, oh, I did it. I made the mistake. So from that point forward, we've been vigilant. Our curriculum is the most approachable in terms of laying down the absolute fundamentals that you've got to have rock solid and only then build in layers of complexity on top of. Great question. 
Super proud of that. And yes, you're right to put a laughing emoji, Matthew, because it was embarrassing. And Jack teases me about it to this day. Anyway, I have a couple questions for you. And, and you know, I'm going to get I'm going to get a little bit serious now. I, not not really serious. I, I just I'd, I'd ask you to really consider your answer to these questions. Are you working a dead end job? And I don't mean that in a disparaging way. I mean that for you and your personal goals. Is it not going to get you where you want to go? Is there an income ceiling in your industry that you look at it and you're like, even if I work my butt off, that peak isn't high enough. Maybe you're not even employed or maybe you have a job where you'll never be able to work from home. It's just the nature of the job. And yet working from home is important to you. Maybe you want to have more time with loved ones or you have a job that you're working 60, 70 hours a week. Or if you really want to make a lot of money, you have to work 60, 70, 80 hours a week. And you're like, I don't want to do that. The question is, this is, a, this is a question only you can answer is, is it time for a career change? If it is, Tech Academy is the solution. We are career change experts. This is what we do. We've done it for over a decade. That bridge in our logo rep is on purpose. We represent a bridge from you know, the average person into technology expertise, comfort in understanding and using technology. And it works. Most of our graduates make $30 an hour on average in their first job. That's $60,000 a year to begin with. Now, not every job is that way. Some are lower, some are higher, but that's the average over a decade. And, we, and it's not just a few people. We have over a thousand graduates working in tech. And they're working in all kinds of jobs, from small businesses, mom and pop stuff, medium-sized businesses, to the really big places like Nike or Uber or Epic Games or Disney or Facebook. We've got people placed in all those, those companies and more, right? So I just want to remind you, we have open enrollment, which means if this is the right fit for you, you can start anytime. And so I encourage you to enroll now. Here's how you do that. Oh, ooh, ha, ha. oh man, I can't believe we're doing this. Not everybody knows about this. There's a couple, there's a couple special things that are only approved for the month of May. I've been out of town for a little bit. I forgot it is in fact May. So check this out. For students who enroll this month, the month of May, first thing is a 50% off tuition discount. If you can pay your whole tuition up front, straight off the bat, 50% discount on your tuition. And we're not going to charge you any sales tax. And we're going to send you every one of our technology books. Jack and I have written seven technology books. We've sold tens of thousands of copies of these. They're very effective. And we're going to give you a free set to help you on your journey in technology. Normally, we don't just give all of these away. And this part's really cool. Jack and I have been working on something for a while, and we just published it. It's a career planning guide. Think about this. You finally break into tech, whether it's, you know, going to school, you know, for college or going to our boot camp or another boot camp or self-study, you get that first job. And after the like elation wears off, then one of the next questions you're going to have is like, what do I do now? How do I manage my career? How do I navigate this new landscape? And so we put together a career planning guide, and it is powerful, super valuable data on exactly how to plan for your first six months, your first 18 months, and your first 36 months. That's the career planning guide. We have never seen all this stuff collected in one place. It's super valuable. And again, that's your gift for free for enrolling in May. Then... The Tech Academy Accelerator that I talked about at the beginning, you get three months of free access to that. Now, that means you're going to get three months of me in meetings. And for some of you, they not, may, not, may, not, may not be a bonus. I don't know. It's up to you. But in all seriousness, it's going to give you so much exposure to senior. Uh, I am, I've been doing this for a long time. And I do have a, a lot I can teach. And I really like to do so. 
And so you get three months of that access for free. And finally, you have unlimited job placement assistance. No matter how long it takes, if you've gone through the program and you graduated, and you're working with us on job placement, we will work with you for as long as it takes to get you that first job. For some people, that's really quick. For some people, it can take a while. But no matter what, if you're still in it pushing, we're still there with you. We've never made that commitment before. And we're doing that for people that enroll in May. What does that mean? Well, it means you should apply. And here's how you do that. If you could drop, yeah, there's that link. Thank you, Regina. Um, Alberto, what you want to do is grab that link that Regina just dropped in. This is for anybody else, okay? And it's a really simple contact form. Just drop in, I think it's name, email, phone number. It's super simple, okay? And there's two things that are super important. One, fill out the form right away, okay? It doesn't take long. And two, right after the form on, on our website is a series of steps all about the Tech Academy. Videos and articles and optional steps even to book a call with our admissions personnel so you can learn as much as possible about the school and how we work and whether or not it's going to be a good fit for you, okay? Now, you should complete all those steps after the event, but I, I want to reiterate, fill this form out now. If this, is a, if this is up your alley, fill out the form. We'll get a hold of you afterwards and you know be able to get you all the information you need. We we'll go ahead and fill that out. I'm going to take a sip of coffee. And please stick around. Your free gift is coming in a moment. Thank you, MR. So glad to have you here. <laughs> Matthew, I'm not going to give you a free toaster. And if I do, it will be a non-Euclidean space toaster. And when you put your bread in, it'll disappear forever. Yes, I'm a nerd. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> it says that's cold. Well, it might be. We don't know. It's in non-Euclidean space, so I don't think temperature applies. Okay. Remember I said you don't have to be a nerd to do our program? You really don't, <laughs> which is good <laughs> because you'd have to put up with way too much of me. All right, good. So I want to present another really cool opportunity to you really quickly. Since our graduates love us, Referrals have always been one of our top enrollment sources over, over the last several years, right? And so for a long time, and this is still current, we offer 5% commission payment for all referrals. So if someone enrolls that you referred, we cut you a check for 5% of what they paid, period, end of story. Now, that's not just constrained to our graduates. That can be for you. So if you have someone you think should be talking to us, in a moment, you can get an email address to get a hold of us. Send us their information. And if they end up signing up for the school, we'll send you a 5% commission check. Now, I mentioned our books. This is a bit more data about those. Because, again, if you enroll this month, you get all of these. Three Learn Coding Basics and Hours books, a coding book for kids and young adults, a technology basics dictionary with thousands of simple, clear definitions for all of these weird technical terms, a project management handbook on exactly how you make software, and you are not stupid, which is it's called You Are Not Stupid, Computers and Technology Simplified. It is a very valuable book, which essentially removes all sort of mystery from every area of technology. It includes a whole bunch of like the background and history to help you understand how we even got where we got. So free gift time, baby. It's our, it's our intro to Python book. Now, this is, I want to stress, it's for students in the United States only. Sorry, okay? Although there's a super cheap Kindle version if you want to get it on Amazon. But we'll send you a physical copy of this book. It's large format, makes it easier to actually go through and do the exercises in. And it's really valuable. Like, we go into a lot more detail in this book about the five fundamental elements of any computer program. Obviously, there's a lot more room in this book. It's 50, 60 pages long. A lot more data about Python. Highly recommend this book. If you want a copy, then Regina just dropped an email address in the chat. Grab that email address, books at learncodinganywhere.com, and send us, this is important, send us your full name and a mailing address. Every once in a while, someone forgets to put a mailing address, and we actually are going to send you a book. But we can't do that if we don't have a mailing address for you, right? So again, only in the United States, but give us a full mailing address with city, state, zip, 
Also, of course, any questions that we didn't get to, you can ask in there. They'll forward them on to me. And if there's referrals, drop their name and contact information in the email. We will keep track of that, of the referral, and get you a commission check if they end up signing. Okay? All right. I'm going to wait a moment there for people to grab that if they need to. And then we're going to talk about how to get copies of this if you want to watch the recording again. All right. Now, Machine is going to drop this link in the chat as well. This is for our link tree. If you've never used link tree, it's a great little service where you can aggregate, you can collect all of your links together. And at our link tree, we have links to our free educational YouTube videos, links to our books and dictionary, to our upcoming meetups, which is super valuable, and to all of our social media accounts. So first of all, please follow us on social media. Also, invite your friends to future meetups in classes, right? And tag us on social media. Let us know. In fact, you can get your own free copy of You Are Not Stupid just for doing one simple thing. If you will share out the link to the next class in such a way that we are tagged, we'll notice and we'll put your hat in the, you know, your, your name in the hat for getting your own free copy of You Are Not Stupid. We give one away every week. So share the next event link and tag the Tech Academy. I don't care which platform it is, we're on all of them. So share the event and tag the Tech Academy. We will see that and you'll have a chance to win your own copy of You Are Not Stupid and we'll send it out to your house. So thank you so much for attending, super appreciate it. I really love how involved everyone was tonight. It was fantastic, okay? Um, please come to our next event and reminder, fill out the form, uh, Lavelle, um, send that to the email address books at learncodinganywhere.com if you wouldn't mind. I will probably grab it out of the chat, but I want to make absolutely sure it gets to the right person. So send that address information there. Um, please fill out the form to learn more about the coding boot camps. And we will see you at the next event. I'll stick tight for a second just for people to grab any links that are in chat that they need to. Otherwise, have a great evening.